Well, I'm glad to be with you today to address the subject of uh, the whole Christian foundation for math and also the opinions about science for the sake of the scientists who are among us as well. I would imagine as you come into this class, you've got to have come in with a pretty large degree of skepticism. You know, this fellow's going to try to tell us that in order to do math and to do science, one has got to have a Christian outlook on life, one has got to have understood the biblical teaching about God and man and the universe and all those sorts of things. Come on now, how can that really be? If it has appeared, um, I think throughout the history of Western thought, it certainly appears to us in the 20th century that subjects such as mathematics and science, or maybe physics or biology or what have you, are subjects which are religiously neutral. That is to say, they have nothing to do with religious commitment one way or another, whether you have to be a, 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 a Baptist or whether you're a Buddhist, whether you're a theist or a, an atheist. It just doesn't seem to make any difference one way or another. So when we talk about, say, a, a Christian mathematician or a Christian physicist, what we must mean, of course, is a, a mathematician who prays in his private life. Obviously, this Christianity doesn't have anything to do with his work in math. People will say, surely, the world considerations, religious considerations, don't have any impact upon mathematics. Two plus two is four for Buddhist, just like it is for Christian. Two plus two is four for atheist, just like it is for theist. And so they will say that the way in which a person looks upon reality and how we know what we know and how we should live our lives is really irrelevant to mathematics. Questions, fundamental questions, presuppositions we have about reality, knowledge, and behavior are what we call a worldview. A worldview is a network of presuppositions in terms of which everything in human experience is interpreted and by which all human reasoning is guided. A network of presuppositions in terms of which everything in human experience is interpreted and all human reasoning is guided. Everyone has just such a network of presuppositions about what is ultimately real, what is not real, how we know what we know, and how we should live our lives. And in terms of that network, in terms of that package deal, how you look upon the world and place in the world and think in the world, in terms of that world, all of your experience is interpreted. And in terms of that world, your thinking is God. People will tell you, well, philosophical, religious matters like this ultimate worldview that people have cannot possibly have an effect upon the truths of mathematics. Two plus two is four for everyone. Are the truths of mathematics completely unaffected by the existence of God, however? I want to pose that question and I'm going to answer it in the negative. And it'll take me a little while to get around to the conclusion, but that is ultimately what I want to ask you about today. Are the truths of mathematics completely unaffected by the existence of God? It would seem, after all, that there's widespread agreement about mathematics across all religious lines. And because there is this apparent widespread agreement, people tend to think religious commitments don't have anything to do with it. In passing, let me suggest to you the reason why students who are new to a field whether it be philosophy or history or physics or mathematics, the reason why students often get the impression that there's widespread agreement is because, first of all, adherents of all fields in the academic curriculum tend to exclude those who disagree from the scholarly community. That is to say, you will be taught by someone who has a particular point of view. He goes to professional meetings and teaches in schools where those who have radically different outlooks in the field tend not to be invited. That's one way in which the scientific community almost always gives the artificial appearance of uniformity among its ranks. And secondly, people have got to write simplified textbooks for a wide audience of students. We did have introductory textbooks where we could give to thousands of different kinds of students with different backgrounds. We wouldn't be able to begin the educational process. Well, when you read these textbooks, then you get the impression that 
We don't have widespread disagreement, but there's this kind of homogenized uniform outlook on math and science. It's very artificial. As a matter of historical fact, just if you look at the history of the science of mathematics, you will see that decisions about mathematical truth have been decisively influenced by the world religion or the ultimate philosophy or philosophy of life is the person who is discussing that. It's just a matter of history that math has not been as if we're totally neutral with respect to religion or philosophical world. I think of the Pythagoreans, for instance, who rejected the existence of irrational numbers and did so on a religious basis. Now, whether they're right or wrong, the point is you have to debate their religious foundation in order to come to a conclusion on that mathematical question. Now, the philosopher Leibniz had very distinctive views of infinity that were affected by his whole world alignment. Emmanuel Kant held that Euclidean geometry was known to be true a priori, that is to say, prior to observation and experience in the world. It was a rational truth. And, uh, of course, we have real problems with that with the development of Ramanian geometry and, and other deviant geometries, and then you have questions as to which is true to reality. Does it even make sense to ask which geometry is true to reality? All of those sorts of issues are affected by your philosophy, by your religious outlook, because you're asking what is real, how do we know what is real, and how we should live our lives. Think about it this way. The claim that metaphysics, metaphysics is the study of reality, the nature and structure and origin of reality. People will say that metaphysics is irrelevant to mathematics, but that claim itself, just put that up on the board, metaphysics is irrelevant to mathematics. That in itself is a metaphysical dogma, isn't it? It's a certain metaphysical dogma about mathematics and the nature of mathematics. And so it turns out that metaphysics is not irrelevant to math, at least to the extent in claiming that it is irrelevant to math. In terms of a person's theory of knowledge, what we call epistemology, in terms of a person's theory of knowledge, how does one determine what the relationship can and cannot be between theology and mathematics? People have different theories of knowledge, and those theories of knowledge touch on religious matters, and those theories of knowledge determine questions like, how do we know the relationship between theology and mathematics? You see, the claim that math is neutral to worldviews or philosophies or religious commitment is on the very face of it, historically false and inherently incredible. And yet it's a very widespread notion, it's a very popular idea. It's the one I would imagine you come in to this lecture with today. There have been a number of disagreements in the history of mathematics that are affected by philosophical or religious commitments. I think, uh, as one example, if you want to give us some of your notes, just consider the school of mathematical philosophy known as intuitionism. Intuitions reject the law of excluded middle. The law of excluded middle tells us that something is either A or not A. There isn't any you know, middle ground between those two. You don't have any third option, as it were. And when you hold that as the case, that uh, all choices are by A It's either yes or no, A or not A. Then what you can do if you want to prove A or not A is reduce the opposite to an absurdity. And so proof by reducting at absurdity, taking the opposite of what you want to prove and showing that it reduces to an unacceptable conclusion to some kind of absurdity or irrationality is used often in mathematics as a way of proving something. But intuitionists do not accept the law of the middle, and therefore they don't accept proof by reduction out of certainty. Now there's a case where a particular philosophical outlook, philosophy and religion, and they are just different sides of the same points, or a matter of vocabulary you use, than it is the issues you're considering. These philosophical, which is to say religious commitments, affect what they accept as proof in math. Intuitionists reject as undecided, that is to say, they reject as neither true nor false, premises which we cannot check or prove are known. When you have a premise that cannot be verified or disproven, the intuitionists say it's neither true nor false, rather than saying it's either true or false and we just don't know. For instance, consider this uh, proposition. 
There is a sequence of seven consecutive sevens in the decimal extension of pi. Is that true? No one knows. No one has had time. No one has the uh, infinite extension of time or ability to follow the decimal extension out to discover if that's the case. Now, since we are not able to determine whether there is a sequence of seven to seven in the decimal extension of pi, and intuitions would say, you don't say that it's true or false, but unknown. You have a third category altogether, the undecidable. The interesting thing about intuitions' approaches to those matters is that from a philosophical standpoint, they are assuming that man is the measure of all things. And therefore, man's ability becomes the measure of whether something can be true or false. If man doesn't have the ability to determine, then you don't say it's true or false. You bring a third category in. That is a philosophical and, in that sense, religious decision. Mathematicians have problems with such uh, quirky ideas as infinity and zero, very opposites of one another, but why should we stop and think about this? The concept of infinity in math. Right. I want you to think for a minute about the set of all real numbers. Is the set of all real numbers infinite in extension? Obviously, the additive premise is telling you, yes, they are. It goes on and on and on and on. Maybe it's too big for any human being to ever count it all out. But nevertheless, it is infinite, the set of all real numbers. Now, I want you to think about something that would be considered a subset of this set, and therefore should be not as great an extension. Now let's consider the set or subset of all even numbers. What is the extension of the set of all even numbers? Well, it just keeps going on and on and on as well, right? And so here you have a rather bizarre situation where one set that is the greater, by definition, has a subset which is actually equal to it in extension. It's equal to it in its cardinality, as we said. And that's because the infinite set of numbers is going to have also an, even, an infinite set of even numbers and an infinite set of odd numbers. This is something, it's a rather bizarre conclusion you have to come to if you're going to consider infinity in set theory. Or consider our problems we have with uh, the concept of zero. Zero real is zero real. I'm going to give you a proof here. You want to write this down. It would be helpful later if you want to learn to be good liars. I'm going to show you how you can prove the so one equals two. Is this acceptable thus far? Is it the case that zero times one is equal to zero times two? That would be two on both sides, right? Now, what if I have um, one over zero and I multiply both sides of my equation with that number right there? I mean, you have elementary math here again. You realize if you apply the same function to both sides. That if it's true to begin with, it's going to be the next step, it's going to be true also. So I'm going to multiply 1 over 0 times 0 times 1, and then 1 over 0 times 0 times 2. Okay? All of you who passed high school algebra, you know the next step is going to be, right? These zeros are going to cancel out. So you're going to have 1 times 1, these zeros cancel out, 1 times 2. 1 times 1 is 1, 1 times 2 is 2, and I think I've earned lunch today. I'm able to do something like that fantastic, I've proven that 1 equals 2 now. No, there's no magic there. I mean, this is a legitimate proof. Unless you do what? Unless you reject 1 over 0. It's not real, and you can't do something which is not real in this situation. But then that creates its own trouble, too. What do you mean, zero's not real? You can't divide by zero. Zero's a real number you can divide by it. <laughs> How would you like someone to suggest zero's not real when you get a check for $1,000? You say, well, that's really just a check for $1, because zero's not real. Okay, I realize there's a sense in which these are very profound philosophical issues, but you can also, in day-to-day -day life, understand there's something kind of funny going on here with this concept of infinity and this concept of zero. How do people decide this sort of thing? How do you resolve the paradoxes of infinity or the difficulty with rejecting and yet accepting the reality of zero? It's going to require something more than just math. Now, I'll, I'll tell you the truth. I know that it's warm. You probably are interested in lunch. But to whatever degree you have been listening to me, those of you who have been listening, if I were you, I think I'd be saying, look, when I came in here, I knew how to do my math homework. 
There wasn't a lot of question about it. I mean, what on earth is this guy talking about? He can come here and play all these silly things on the beginning, but I know how to balance my checkbook, and that's really all I can Honestly, the smiles on your face have betrayed you. I knew that you were thinking you were getting too abstract and weird. But I want to suggest to you that as abstract and as strange as some of these questions may seem, you cannot be satisfied to come in and say, look, I know how to do that because when you say that, you were saying, look, someone taught me what is acceptable to procedure. I apply this function, I write this on the paper, I turn it in, I get an A. I know how to jump in the hoops. I can do math. I think I can make my point if I were to, by analogy, suggest that that's the way most people know how to do their internet tax forms, too. They don't really understand the huge legislation and bureaucratic way of behind behind the instructions for doing their income tax. But do you know anybody who says it really doesn't make any difference what they say? I'll just let them teach me how to do my income tax. I do this step, and this step, and this step, and then I take out my wallet, I take that much, that much money out, and send it to the government. And that's fine with me. As long as I'm able to function effectively, that's all that counts. Well, I'll tell you when it comes to something as nitty-gritty as how much money you send to the government, no one says it's enough just to follow the rules and know how to, you know, take the steps to the conclusion. Then you start worrying about what lies in Why is it that I am applying this equation here? Why don't I get a full deduction there and so forth? Similarly, though it may not have immediate effects like your income tax, you can't come in today and be satisfied to say, well, look, I can get by by doing my math homework. I know what steps to follow. I'm just like, you know, a good little dog that's been taught where to jump and where to lie down and how to roll over and so I can do math. There are very serious questions having to do with math and whether it's even possible that you need to consider. I'm going to forget some of these more difficult ones and try to give you a few more down-to-earth ones. Is it true that religion is totally irrelevant to mathematics. I'm going to propose a couple of religious points of view to see what happens to now, given their truth. On the hypothesis of radical monism, what happens to mathematics? Radical monism holds that there is only one reality, hence monism. Philosopher as brilliant as Parmenides, the pre-Socratic era of Greek philosophy, maintained that this was the case. That though it appears to us that there are many things and that there's motion in this world, in fact, reality is but one unmoving, solid thing. Now, that's the philosophy. The religious expression of that is found in Eastern Hinduism. The Hindu religion teaches that ultimately reality is but one thing. Let me quote to you from the philosophy of the Upanishads. Paul Dusan says... Speaking of Hindu thought, there is no plurality and no change. Nature, which presents the appearance of plurality and change, is a mere illusion, Maya. It looks like that there's change, that there is a plurality of things in our experience. We see many trees and cars and chairs and what have you. But all of that is illusion. Ultimately, there is no change. There is no plurality. And so, now I quote from the Upanishads themselves, there is nothing in the whole universe besides Atman. No second outside of it, no other distinct from it. No second. Now, isn't that a mathematical dogma? That there can be no second, there can be nothing distinct from Atman, the universal soul. If everything is one, then there isn't going to be any science of mathematics. And so before you would even take a math class, theoretically, you would have to be sure that Hinduism is mistaken about that. You would have to understand what arguments are given by Hindus for the radical monism of reality. If reality is radically one, then the truths of arithmetic are all illusory, and they are all invalidated. The truths of arithmetic would be invalidated except in a worldview which acknowledges an ultimate metaphysical plurality. You have to have some philosophy of life that says there are many things. Now, that's not hard for you because all of you grew up in an unthinking way in a Western culture to taught you there are many things. You don't come from an Eastern background that gives credibility to what I've just been trying to tell you about the alleged oneness of everything beyond the appearance of your physical experience. 
we all are more familiar with a radical pluralism, the idea that there are a lot of things. In fact, the ancient Greek philosopher Democrates taught that reality is made up of an infinite number of atoms falling through empty space. There, you don't have the radical monism of Parmenides or the Hindus. You have rather a radical plurality where there's an infinite number of things. This comes down to us today in Western schools of philosophy that are nominalistic, and in some cases, empiricistic. The nominalist tells us only particulars exist. Only individuals exist. Individual particular experiences. So I have an experience of this chair, I have an experience of this chair, an experience of this chair, an experience of this chair, and all I know are those particular experiences. But now the problem is I try to communicate to you my experience, and I describe every one of them as an experience of a chair. But you see, I haven't had any experience of a universal abstract chair, have I? I just know seat number 16 and seat number 17 and seat number 18, but I can't even call them seats because to call them seats assumes the unity, the universality, something that goes beyond the particular. So I'll just call every one of my experiences by number. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And I experience an orange, I experience a milkshake, I experience a seat, I experience a car. But we can't call them by their common names because that assumes they aren't particulars, they are part of a general class. And so we resort to just using numbers. I identify my experience, experience one. Well, I can't call them experiences, because that's too general. I'll just call it one, two, three. But what's the problem with that? Some people have thought you could buy with just names, or simple tokens like numbers. Well, let's see how well that works. I'll ask you a very simple question, no tricks here. Is this the number two? Have I written the number two on the board? I have? That was the wrong answer. Because if this is the number two, two no longer exists. I just killed two. Forget using two for the rest of your life. Try one, three, four, and other combinations, but no two, because you told me that was two. Oh, let's try that. Which of these is the number two? The one on the right or the one on the left? Oh, you that. Or is this the number two? Now, if you are awake, and I probably filled out a number of you already, if you are awake, you don't want to call any of these the number two. These are all numerals. They are not numbers. A numeral is an instance or an instantiation or a transcription of a number. And so I can write something, a total for two. And I can get rid of the total. I can get rid of the inscription, but two hasn't been affected either way. However, in our Western tradition, we have been taught that only particulars exist. Go back to the blackboard, I've already erased it if you want up here. I've got a particular experience, a little squiggly thing that looks like the two. A particular experience, that squiggly thing that looks like the number two. A particular experience of something else we call Roman and most of it we call two. I have particular experiences. How can I say those are all particular instances of something I've never experienced. Has anyone ever experienced two? Not two apples, not two telephones, but just two by itself. The abstract reality of two. No, you haven't. You think you have, we want the doctors to examine you. That would be a very strange thing indeed. Imagine somebody said, oh, I made a mistake, I swallowed two this morning. No, you can't encounter two in your empirical human experience like that. Two is a different kind of metaphysical reality. And yet our Western thought has taught us that reality is made up only of particulars. And so anything that is not particular has to be something like a, a, a mental construct, something artificial, something that's not really real. And in so saying, we lose numbers, we lose all sayings, everything that has identity or similarity in experience. We lose classes, we lose sex, we lose all universals and all laws. Now I'm going to ask you, would you be able to do math without numbers, sets, classes, universals, and laws? Possible to do math without those things? No. And so now we got a real problem. 
Eastern thought tells us everything is radically one. There goes math. There's no math because there's no numbers if everything is one. In Eastern thought, by the way, you have this very interesting formula that has to be accepted as true. In Eastern thought, everything's one, so obviously one plus one has got to be one. Here's the problem. Now, those are just an example of some truths of mathematics in Eastern thought. See, if you can put together a coherent system of math, then you've got to acknowledge that this is all true. If all is one, there is no math. On the other hand, Western thought, which we just considered, says, no, there are many things. There's a plurality in ultimate reality. It destroys math as well, because if everything is particular, then we don't have numbers and sets and laws and so forth. It thus turns out that in order to do math, one has got to resolve the metaphysical question of the one and the many. Is reality one or is it many? Let me pose another problem for you before I try to offer what I think is an answer to these difficulties. With respect to any science, we have the right to ask, with what is it concerned and how does it justify its truths? When you study biology, you want to know what is biology study and what does it take to prove a truth in biology. Now, if math is a science, we should be able to give an answer to those fundamental questions. Then. What is it that math studies? What is it? And secondly, how are mathematic truths justified or proved? Let's consider both of these for a moment. What is the object of mathematical study? Some people would say numbers. More sophisticated people would say sets and numbers. We could actually get beyond that. But you see, once we say math studies numbers, let's take the real elementary approach here. Then we're going to have to be able to say what numbers are. Do numbers exist? Do they exist like apples? No. I mean, we've already seen that you can swallow an apple and you can't swallow two, so they don't exist like apples. We know what it means for an apple to exist, what does it mean for a number to exist? So some people are taking a more mentalist approach. Does love exist? Most people, especially most college students, would be willing to say, of course, love is all you need, right? Love exists. Well, numbers like love for them? Are they kind of subjective things? You know, who we do in presentations? What are numbers? Do they exist? And we can't specify what a number is. Do we even know what the science of math is all about? I would people who say numbers are only mental construct. Just a rational reconstruction of experience. It's something we do in our head. Oh, is that right? They're just a mental construct. So in studying math, what we are doing is studying a very narrow domain of psychology, right? Mental constructs. And people can have different mental constructs. What is the ontological status of mental Constructs. We have all kinds of problems here, but let's forget that for a minute. Let's just say, look, everybody knows what math is about. I don't think everybody does. It's one of the humorous things to me as a debater and a philosopher. So when people say, oh, well, we all know about math, they say, great, let's spend a little bit of time over lunch. You explain it. I'm going to say, what is math about? And just watch people squirm. They don't know what math is about. We all know how to do math. Secondly, how are mathematical truths justified? There are three schools of thought here. There are those who, in one way or another, take what we in philosophy call an a priori approach to justifying the truths of mathematics. To be a priori means to offer a proof which does not depend upon, and therefore it, that says it's prior to observation. It's not based upon any sensation or experience in the world. It's something which is a rational proof that you don't have to go out and check. If I say that the barn down the road is red, there's only one way for you to verify that truth, and that's to go out and look, right? You can't sit here, I mean, apart from memory of having looked at the barn, you can't sit here and rationally decide on some conceptual basis whether the barn is red or not. So proving that the barn is red is not a priori, it's what's called a posteriori. It comes after observation, after experience, and is based upon what I can come in contact with in my experience. A truth is proven a priori when it is done in a simple conceptual matter that doesn't rely upon any experience in the physical world at all. If I tell you, if P, then Q, second premise, P, third premise, I conclude, Q, I can prove that to you without going out and looking at anything. 
barns or cars or outdoors or what have you. Because it so happens that you can demonstrate the truths of logic a priori without experience of the world. Now let's ask ourselves whether math is true, the truths of math are proven in an a priori way. If you say yes, they are, then we have a couple of real strange questions that I've yet to find an answer for. One, if the truths of math have an a priori character, why is it that the truths of math turn out to be confirmed in our contingent experience? Why is it then, if I don't have to go to the experience and verify the truths of math, nevertheless the truths of math always apply in my experience? You may think you have an answer to that, by the way, the truth is the third thing to look at, the conventionalist approach, or the roots define that. If we just define it that way, if the truths of math are a priori true because we just stipulate that that's how we'll use two and four, then the real question is, why do we build bridges using these laws of math and so forth? And if we stipulated other laws and other consistent systems, would they also build bridges? This is a real strange question here about the relationship between what is totally mental or conceptual, and the experience I have in this world. If I justify math in a mental or conceptualist way, why does it work in the world, and work always in the world? Secondly, if you hold to the a priori approach to justifying the truths of math, you have to ask why the paradoxes of math arise at all. For a priori, we'd be able to avoid paradox, wouldn't we? And so other people, like John Stuart Mill, have taken the approach that the truths of math are really truths that have been verified over and over and over and over again in our experience of the world. They are really a posteriori truths, but of such a high level of confirmation that that's why they seem unassailable. Well, if you take this a posteriori approach to verifying the truths of math, the question is going to become, on what basis do you generalize from experienced cases to unexperienced cases, or you will why do you universalize the truths of math? You say, well, every time in my experience that I had a two and a two, I had a four as well. Every time in my experience, well, but you haven't experienced everything. My guess is there are probably some students here in the room that have never been to China. Is two plus two four in China? Now you think you know the answer to that, unless you take the opposteriori approach to the justification of mathematic truths, because you don't know that two plus two equals four in China on the a posteriori theory, unless you've been to China to check it out, or someone has been there. And someone says, oh, well, I know someone's been to China. They came back and they told me two plus two was four in China. Well, I can push a little further and say, well, it was the case two plus two is four in China when they were there. But is two plus two equal four in China right now? Anyone have, you know, this, you know compelling impetus to go pick up the phone and call and find out? It's kind of like finding out you know, the rate of you know, yen over there today. Is two plus two four today? No one bothers to do that. And it is simply incredible to think that we just had so many experiences that we have the right to generalize universally these laws of math. If they are like checking that the barn is red, you cannot universalize them. You can only say, as far as we know, two plus two is four. And that doesn't seem to make sense either. Then the truths of mathematics are not absolute. And if they are not absolute, then one, we cannot universalize them or count on them to apply week by week and month by month. Then you really should worry about new math, not what is coming to be called a new math. You should worry about that math becomes new all the time, but it doesn't. And so then finally, we have those who say, okay, this is not really a question because there isn't any truth of math. The truths of math are just what we call linguistic stipulations or conventions. We just decide we're going to talk that way. Well, then I've got another question for you. Do we stipulate we're going to talk that way? If it's stipulative convention, then it's just another form of a priori mathematical truth. And you have the same problem. So can we stipulate that experience will fit in with what we are using as our language about math? Why do we have paradoxes if we're stipulating how we're going to talk? We can avoid the math paradoxes. On the other hand, we have an utilitarian approach to conventionalism that says the reason that we speak this way is because it's useful. But then we're back to the problems of the a posteriori approach. Will it be useful tomorrow to use these truths of math? Who knows? You see, when all is said and done, you can't do math, you can't account for what you're doing anyway, unless you solve some pretty sticky 
philosophical problems about whether reality is one, whether it is many, what the nature of objects are, particularly objects of math, and how we know what we know when it comes to those objects of math. Now, let me throw in one last thing before I come to a conclusion this afternoon. Remember, people do math. People do math. Math, in a sense, is an activity. It is not an abstract, person-free entity. When we talk about math, we're talking about people doing certain things. And the question is going to arise, what ethical standards will govern the doing of math? If math really is neutral, it shouldn't have anything to do with ethics. And I dare say we have some people who teach physics or math here, and they'd be appalled to think that their physics or math classes are not governed by some kind of ethical standard. Try cheating in your final exam. You see, well, in math, that's ethics free, religiously neutral. You say, oh, you know, that's, just, that's a cheap shot, okay? In school, you've got to live by certain rules, no matter what course you take. Okay, forget school. Go out and life, get a job in a lab somewhere, and just start fudging your conclusions. Just start saying, well, you see, if I want to get some kind of grant or I want to get a raise, I've got to come up with certain conclusions. And by the way, if I, if I make this complicated enough and no one checks on me, I'll get by with it. Does math allow for lying or not? I mean, if you, if you say, no, in math, the doing of math requires integrity, then you're saying that math is not altogether free of religion and philosophical or worldly considerations. And what have we accomplished today? I hope I have accomplished the destruction of this myth that math is a neutral subject that it doesn't have any kind of philosophical foundation and that religious commitments like the existence of God have nothing to do with it. You see, but everyone's able to do that, even though they're not able to do philosophy and even though they disagree with each other on religion. Please distinguish between the ability to do something and the ability to explain what you're doing. Please distinguish between practice and theory. That distinction is common in all of life. You know, there are people who have the ability to swim, who could begin to give you a scientific explanation of how the human body can do that in the water, and explain all of the coordination of the muscles and the joints and so forth, and buoyancy and so forth. The ability to swim has nothing to do with the theory of swimming. People can bake cakes without knowing anything about chemical reactions. People can use computers without having the slightest idea of how to explain the workings of a computer. People take medicine for pain, even though they couldn't begin to explain to you the biology of the human body and why this medicine works the way it does. Yes, people can do things and not have a theory that goes with it. They cannot explain it. They just kind of blindly accept it. And I will grant to you, we'll relieve today, people can do math. They can count and yet not be able to give you a theory of math. To put it as Dr. Van Til used to at Westminster Seminary. People can count without being able to account for their counting. I haven't invited you to this lecture today to convince you that unbelievers and non-Christians don't do math. They do. What I would like you to see is they cannot account for it. They cannot explain it. They cannot justify it. They cannot offer a theory that accounts for their practice of doing math. You say, well, Dr. Bronson, can Christians do so? Well, if I had time to give you an extensive course in Christian philosophy, I could be more convincing, but in the moments that remain, I'd like to suggest to you, yes, Christians can answer these conundrums, because we have a world view, just like the atheists and the Buddhists are the Hindus. And within the Christian presuppositional framework with respect to reality, Epistemology, our theory of knowledge, and how we should live our lives. Yes, we can account for math. Let's begin at the easy end. How about that ethical question? But all right, for people in math fudge on their results or lie and not show integrity? Well, of course, it's the Christian world who says that God is true, and God requires us to tell the truth and to reflect his character in all that we do. It has nothing to do with being able to get away from it. So the ethical issue. I mean, hours more to be said, but you can get in your notes that much. The ethical problems in terms of math are answered by the Christian worldview. How about the ontological and the metaphysical questions? What are numbers? The Bible teaches the most fundamental metaphysical truth 
that God is an eternal, self-contained person, and God is the creator of heaven and earth. There's a difference then between uncreated and created reality. Are numbers part of created reality and therefore subject to all the vicissitudes of time and space, or are numbers like God? Well, if we look at the very character of God in terms of the Christian presentation of it, of God. You see that there is a numerical reality about God, too. There is but one God who exists in three persons, so that both unity and plurality have an equal ultimacy with respect to reality. We are not stuck in the trap of Western atheism or Eastern monism because we believe that God made this world in accord with his own character as within his own eternal being, oneness and plurality. We believe also that God created the heavens and the earth, and therefore that every plurality that we see about us in the world today also has a unity that's given to it by the plan and the mind of God. These are not chance particulars. They are what they are, and they have their character, whether they have a class, general character, or a particular individual character, by God's creative design and his sovereign control of all things. Consequently, we have an answer to the difficult metaphysical questions about man. We also have a question about how we know the truths of man. We're able to justify the truths of man, both a priori and a posteriori, just because they reflect the mind of God who has also controlled and created the world in terms of his own way of living. Two plus two is four in China today, not because we've stipulated it in some convention or there's some kind of rational structure that floats out there that we get in tune with. Two plus two is four in China today because the same God who created the state of Virginia controls people here right now, created China and is controlling China as well. And he does this controlling in terms of his unchanging character. Now, much more needs to be said about a Christian theory of man, no doubt about that. I hope that I've accomplished at least this little task, however, today with you, in convincing you that man is not somehow this innocent, neutral, religious free zone of academic endeavor. Man has its philosophical problems and presuppositions, and therefore it too is religious in character. And the religious choices that people make be they Hindu, Buddhist, Christian, Unitarian, Trinitarian, what have you, will in theory affect what they believe about man. Not whether they do it, but whether they can account for it. My argument would be only the Christian ultimately can account for the math that we all practice in our day-to-day -day affairs. Thank you.